Well, family, today we're going to begin a brand new teaching series that I am excited about. It's going to be our last teaching series of 2023, and we have entitled this teaching series Open Handed. Can you say that after me? Say Open Handed. Open-handed. Somebody say it again. Say Open Handed. Open-handed. Now, for every teaching series that we have, we have a series theme, a big idea. The theme for this series, Open Handed, is we want to learn how to live with a generosity mindset. We want to learn how to live with a generosity mindset. Now, understand that we have some new people, so I want to quickly review just for a few moments, give you a few introductory points. These points won't be up on the screens. Listen to me, and then we'll get into some new information. A few months ago, several weeks ago, we taught a series entitled Lacking Nothing. And in that series, we shared with you that God's will for your life is that you lack nothing. God's will for your family, God's will for your business, is that you have no lack. That's his will. Now, you may be sitting here saying, you may be watching and saying, okay, well, I hear God's will is that I have no lack. Yet, when I look at my finances, when I look at my bank account statement, when I look at my checking account, I hear that it's God's will that I have no lack, but I see lack. I see me coming up short. I don't see in my finances the fact that I have everything that I need. Pastor MK, I hear you saying that God's will is no lack, yet when I look at my reality, there's a gap between what I'm living and what God has said. How, Pastor MK, do I close the gap? How do I get God's will to show up in my life? How do I get God's will to show up in my finances. The way that we're going to close the gap, family, is one word, and that's faith. The way that I get God's Word, His will, to show up in my life, show up in my circumstances, show up in my finances, is through faith. Somebody say this. Say, faith Faith. can close the gap. gap. Let's say that again. Say, faith Faith. can close the gap. A different way that I could say that is that God's will is manifested by faith. You want to see God's will that you lack nothing show up, not just be a scripture, but show up in your life. It's going to show up through faith. Quick faith nugget. Faith has four parts. Faith comes, it begins by hearing. I have to hear God's Word, and specifically, I have to hear God's Word in the area that I'm believing to get a harvest in. If I want to see God's Word show up in my finances, I have to plant the seed of God's Word in that area, listen to teaching, biblical teaching in the area of finances. As I hear God's Word, two things are going to happen. As I'm hearing the general word, the general teaching, what we in church call the Logos word, at some point, if I keep listening to it, I'm going to get a specific word. I'm going to get a specific word, a rhema word that God speaks to me. I need to listen until I get that rhema word. Once I get that specific word, that rhema word, I am now in a position to pray in faith. The Bible says that we're to pray according to God's will. I'm not to just pull stuff out of the sky. A lot of believers don't see the answers to their prayers because they're not praying in faith, and they're not praying according to God's will. They pick something and telling God to confirm it. No, God confirms His Word. And I get that rhema word, that specific word for my circumstance, my situation, through hearing. Somebody say hearing. Once I've heard what God's Word says, the second part of faith is I have to believe what He says. I have to believe what He says independent of how I feel. He says that I am to live a life that lacks nothing, but I don't feel like I got sufficiency. I feel like I'm lacking. I feel like I'm coming up short. I have to make a decision. You have to make a choice to believe God independent of what you're seeing, independent of what you're feeling. Third, faith 
has to speak. You have to say out of your mouth, not what you're feeling. You have to say out of your mouth, not what you're seeing in your present circumstances. You have to say what God says. You have to speak in alignment with Him. And fourth, faith acts. Somebody say that. Say faith Faith. acts. Faith Faith. acts. I have to, number one, act in alignment with what God has said. Secondly, as I am talking to the Holy Spirit, as I'm listening to the Word, I'm listening for instructions. I'm listening for what is the Holy Spirit saying, not just to Faith Chapel, what is the Holy Spirit saying to me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to my family? He's going to give you some instructions in the area that you are believing for. Faith acts on those instructions, regardless of if they're out of my comfort zone. Faith acts on His instructions, the Holy Spirit's instructions, even if we don't understand them. Here's a pro tip. Here's a cheat code. Most of the time, the instructions that the Holy Spirit gives you to act on won't make sense to your natural mind. In other words, the Holy Spirit will tell you to do something that to the natural man, the unsaved person, the unchurched person, sounds like foolishness. Pastor Michael Todd out of Tulsa, Oklahoma says that when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's going to sound crazy. Noah looked crazy obeying an instruction from God to build a boat when there was no rain. But I like how Pastor Mike Todd says it. He says, it's only crazy until it happens. You're only going to look foolish until that manifestation shows up. We're going to get into in this series a faith action that will lead to this no lack life. If I want to see God's will show up in my finances, I have to take faith actions in this area, and I have to obey what God's Word says even though it doesn't make sense. Okay, God, you want me to be generous, but I need money. I need somebody giving to me. Doesn't make sense if I need somebody to give to me to obey an instruction to give something away. But the foolishness of faith will produce results for those who work it. So I want to teach in this first lesson from this title, let's get into some new information. I want to teach from this title, The Generous Life. The Generous Life life. We're not going to just read that the Lord is our shepherd and we lack nothing. We're going to see it. And a part of how we're going to get there is we are going to live a generous life. Now, this sermon is going to be organized in a very easy way for you to follow. First, I'm going to give you three definitions of generosity, and then I'm going to close out the sermon giving you four take-home points. Definitions, four take-home points. To live generously, we have to first define what is generosity. I want us all to be on the same page so that you don't go out and act on something that I didn't say. (laughs) It's going to be important that we all sync this. Uh, What is generosity? Number one, generosity is living open-handed. It's living open-handed. Handed. God puts resources in my hand. The opposite of open-handed is closed-handed. You try to take this out of my hand if you want to. Generosity is not closed-handed, it's open-handed. And we're going to see in this series that when God tells me to take what's in my hand and give it, I'm also positioned to receive what He's trying to put in it. What is generosity? It's living open-handed. Number two, what is generosity? It's giving more than is expected or normal. If this is what people expect, if this this is what's normal and I come up to what's expected, I'm not at a place of generosity yet. The moment that I step past what's expected, I've stepped over into generosity. The moment that I step over past normal, I've stepped over into generosity. What is generosity? Number three, this is a big definition. Generosity is love in action. What is generosity? It is love in action. 
love can be felt before it to truly make a difference in the lives of others and your life, it has to move its way from being a feeling to being an action. And that third definition is going to set up my first take-home point, and that is this. The first take-home point of four is this, is that generosity is God's nature. What is generosity? Generosity is God's nature. That's the first major take-home point. John chapter 3, verse 16 familiar verse. You could quote it like the back of your hand. I want to read John 3.16 from a different translation. It says in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, for God loved the world in this way. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him, Jesus, will not perish but have eternal life. John is writing to us, and he says that God's love for the world, God's love for you wasn't just a feeling. John said that God loved the world in this way he gave. And John says that he gave his one and only. God's gift of Jesus, his one and only son, he only had one, and he gave the only one that he had, was an example of lavish generosity. It was going beyond what was expected. In other words, God gave, but he gave his very best. Generosity is love in action. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 in the New Testament for Everyone translation says, God, after all, did not spare his own son. He gave him, Jesus, up for us all. That was an example of generosity. But Paul says here, how then will God, not with Jesus, freely give all things to us? So Paul adds on to the equation. He says that not only was God generous in giving us Jesus, if all he had given us was Jesus, Jesus would have been enough. But Paul said, no, God went the extra mile with Jesus. Paul said, God gives us freely all things. I don't have to choose between Jesus and silver and gold. Come on now. <laughs> Paul said, God wants to give me both. Why in the world would God give me his only son and then keep giving on top of that? Why would he give me Jesus but also give me righteousness? Why would he give me Jesus but also give me peace? Why would he give me Jesus but also give me joy? He was willing to give you Jesus, and he was willing to freely give you all things in addition to Jesus because generosity is his nature. Second major take-home point, I just have four. Generosity is the believer's nature too. Just four. Take-home point number one, generosity is God's nature. But if you are a believer, if you are a part of God's family, if you have confessed Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, not only is generosity God's nature, generosity is your nature too. Second Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, in the contemporary English version says this, we have everything we need to live a life that pleases God, because God has freely given us all things. It was all given to us by God's own power when we learned that God had invited us to share in his wonderful goodness. So God is good, but this scripture says that not only was God good, God invites us to share in his goodness. Verse 4, God made great and marvelous promises, look at this, so that his nature would become part of us. So that his attributes would show up in our lives. So that we would be a reflection of him, what he looks like, what he does, how he does it, wouldn't just stay in heaven. It would be expressed in the earth through me and through you. As a believer, 
generosity is part of your new nature in Christ. The moment that you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God took out your old nature. He put his nature down on the inside of you. And I am saying that a part of that new nature was the same nature of generosity that he has. Birds fly through the air because flying is their nature. Fish swim through water because swimming in water is their nature. Birds don't just fly through the air on Sundays. Fish don't just swim in water. I'm going somewhere. Fish don't just swim in water on the when they're in church. Come on now, that's good. Fish swim in water on Mondays. Fish swim in water on Wednesdays. Birds fly through the air on Fridays. They don't, they, don't, they don't compartmentalize their behavior to a day. They don't compartmentalize their behavior to a building. Because flying and swimming is their nature. Believer, I am telling you that God wants you to give generously to others because of who you are. Your new nature is one of generosity. Talking about living with a generosity mindset. Now, I don't have statistics to prove this, but I have the microphone, so I'm gonna say it. (laughs) I'm gonna say it. I believe that many believers in the body of Christ have not yet gained a revelation about this nature, uh, about this aspect of their new nature. I believe that many believers would understand that God made them righteous. I think many believers in the kingdom would understand that their name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When I die, I'm going to heaven. But many believers in the body of Christ have not yet gotten a revelation about this aspect of their new nature. You say, well, how can you prove that, preacher? Without a revelation of this part of my nature, I'll say things out of my mouth like I can't give. All right, all right. Mm. Well, I heard heard about the opportunity. I heard what the church is doing. I hear about the needs of other people, but I can't give. I can't give. The reason that I am saying that I can't give is because I don't have a revelation about this aspect of my new nature. Again, when I don't understand this part of my new nature, I will compartmentalize my giving to only when I am in church. Okay, my church asked me to give. I'm going to give. But my family better not ask me for a dime. <laughs> my coworkers, you on your own, champ. I had to pull myself up by my bootstraps. You can do the same. When I don't understand this part of my new nature, I'll compartmentalize it. I have several friends, and this is not true of every believer, but I have several friends who work in the food service industry. They're waiters, they're waitresses, they run restaurants. And for a lot of waiters, I don't have statistics, but for a lot of waiters and waitresses, they do not like to see Christians coming to the restaurant on Sundays. My friends' experience aren't everybody's experience, but a lot of my friends say that Christians who come in on Sundays after leaving church are some of the most demanding customers that they have. I'm hungry. I'm going to run you ragged. I'm going to work you like a Hebrew slave. And then I'm going to leave you a $2 tip. 
Now, what a lot of those believers, because they don't understand this part of their nature, what a lot of those believers would say is, why in the world would I tip them when their behavior didn't deserve it? I had to wait too long to get me some more sweet tea. I ain't tipping that. <laughs> Took too long for my food. They came to their table after us, got their food before us. I am not tipping that. Your behavior as a server does not warrant a tip. Okay, believer. Okay, if that's the standard that we're going to use, I'm going to give you what you deserve. Rhetorical question, rhetorical question. What if God treated you like that? What if God said, okay, got it, got it. Since we're giving people what they deserve, we're called to reflect his nature. Did he give you what you deserved? I am grateful to God that he didn't give me what I deserve. I'm grateful to God that he said, hey, I know this boy is acting up. He know better than to do some of the crazy stuff he's doing, but I'm going to be good to him anyway. I'm going to cover him anyway. Let's keep working with him. Let's be long suffering with him. He'll eventually get his head on straight. I know he's acting crazy now. God didn't treat you that way. You are called to be a reflection of his nature because his nature was placed down on the inside of you. When I understand this part of my nature, this third take-home point will take on greater meaning in my life. Take-home point number three, generosity is a lifestyle, not an event. God never intended for his family to be generous as an event. Yes, he intended for you to be generous at church, but he intended for you to be generous at home. He intended for you to be generous at work. He intended for you to be generous to that family member that you think doesn't deserve your generosity. Again, sometimes people have issues unrelated to us. If the Holy Spirit spoke to you at the restaurant and said, hey, I know their behavior doesn't warrant it, but tip them big, does he have to wrestle you down to get that money out of your hand? What if that seed that they didn't deserve was the thing that was going to open up their heart? What if they've been having family problems all throughout the week and aren't professional enough to keep their personal life from showing up in their, in their, their personal life from showing up in their professional life? God never intended for his family to be generous as an event. We're called to be generous as a lifestyle. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 in the Passion Translation says, Give generously, and generous gifts will be given back to you. God says, as you spread out resources to others, it'll come back generously to you. Shaken down to make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out on you with such overflowing measure that it will run over the top. The measurement of your generosity becomes the measurement of your return. Jesus said, give. Yeah. Luke chapter 6, verse 38 is a command from Jesus to every believer. And he did not say gave. I gave to that last week. I gave to that last time. Jesus said, give. A continuous command. He didn't put a clock on it. 
He didn't put parameters around it. We're to give at home, we're to give at school, we're to give at church, we're to give with friends, we're to give to strangers. Jesus tells us to give. Now, we're going to give you some parameters. We're going to give you some safeguards in this series. But many believers aren't giving generously not because they're trying to stay within some biblical boundary. For a lot of Christians, we just stingy. Not (laughs) y'all. Not y'all. Not y'all. Not y'all. I ain't talking to y'all. Y'all are limitless believers. You understand how to take faith with what God has said, mix faith with it, and we're going to show you on next week. We're going to show you on next week that God will even give you the money that He is commanding you to give. God will give you the money to give and then turn around and bless you for giving what He gave you. But that's next week. That's next week. That's next week. That's next week. I want to end this lesson by giving you the fourth take-home statement. Jesus tells us to give. He did not put parameters or scope around it. Generosity is intended by God to be a lifestyle. And I got good news for you, believer. Giving, this is take home point number four, giving is inseparable from receiving. In the mind of God, giving and receiving go together. You take a quarter, that quarter is going to have a head side to it and a tail side. If you want the quarter, you have to take both sides. You cannot go to the bank and say, hey, give me the head side of the quarter, but you keep the tails. Because the head side of the quarter is inseparable from the tail side. You got some Christians in the body of Christ who are praying prayers. God, give me the tail side of your promise but you can keep the head side. God, I want to receive. Bless me, Lord, indeed. Enlarge my territory. We'll willingly pray that, pray that prayer. But that's the tail side. Jesus said, give. Give. Let it go. You want it to come back to you in a multiplied way, you got to let it go. And when you let it go, you believers should have an expectation to receive. Well, Pastor, I don't understand. I don't don't know if I agree with all that. You ought to just give out of the goodness of your heart. Yes, God does look at motives, but we are called to be a reflection of Jesus. Jesus. Nobody would argue that Jesus was a tremendous giver. But if you're going to truly be like him, if you're going to truly live like him, if you're going to truly be a reflection of him, Jesus wasn't just a great giver. Jesus was a great receiver. What you talking about? What you, what you, what you talking about? When Jesus needed to feed 5,000 men plus women and children, Jesus said, guys, survey what we got. They said, hey, all we have is a little kid's lunch. This is the only lunch that the kid got. And he didn't bring this lunch to feed all these people. Jesus didn't tell the little boy, I can't take your lunch. I can't take this only lunch you got. No, he received the little boy's lunch. And I believe, Scripture doesn't tell us, but I believe that some of those 12 baskets full went back to that little boy. How can you say that? Because in the mind of God, giving is inseparable from receiving. When Jesus needed to teach, he didn't have a boat to teach one of his sermons on. He asked Simon, Simon, can I borrow your boat? Are you willing to give me your boat so that I can 
go a little out on the lake to teach the people. Simon gave Jesus his boat. A few verses later, Simon received a miraculous catch of fish. Fish for Simon wasn't just fish, it was income. God said, cool, I see your heart. Freely you've given me your boat. And Jesus received the boat. He didn't argue. Simon didn't have to say, come on, Jesus, come on, come on. Some Christians, we got to argue you down just to give you something. And some of that is rooted in pride. Some of that is when I reach the top, I don't want anybody to be able to say that they helped me. You're not going to reflect Jesus that way. When Jesus needed to ride into Jerusalem, Palm Sunday, he didn't ride in on his donkey. He received a gift from somebody else. He goes into Jerusalem, has the Last Supper. He didn't have the Last Supper in his house. Somebody gave him a house to have it in, and he received it. Why would Jesus receive all of these gifts from people? Because he was a giver himself. He gave his time. He gave his energy. He gave compassion. He gave power. He gave authority. And Jesus understood in the mind of the Father, giving and receiving go together. Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 through 25 in the Passion Translation says, generosity brings prosperity, not lack. Generosity doesn't bring lack. Generosity doesn't bring scarcity. Okay, if I give this away, I'm not going to have nothing. No, the Bible says generosity brings prosperity. Withholding from charity, being close-handed will bring poverty. Verse 25, those who live to bless others will have blessings heaped upon them, and the one who pours out his life to pour out blessings will be saturated with favor. If I get a revelation of this fourth point, that giving in the mind of God is inseparable from receiving, I will move, you will move from seeing giving as an obligation to an opportunity. Okay, God is asking me to give. God is not trying to take something from me. Okay, here we go, asking for another thing asking to sow into something else. Because in just a couple of weeks, we're going to have Vision Sunday. I'm going to talk to our church about some things that we want to do next year. We're not going to be able to do them for free. It's going to take some financial resources to do some of what we're trying to do. How you hear that appeal will be determined by your revelation of this. Is this an obligation? I already give. It's an obligation. You're asking me to pray about what I should give toward this. Or is this an opportunity for God to take me beyond what I have? Is this an opportunity for God to pour more into my family? Is this an opportunity for God to multiply something to me? God is not trying to take something from you when He asks you to give. He's trying to get something into your open hand. When I understand this revelation that giving is inseparable from, from receiving, when I have a need as a believer, my first thought and my first prayer won't be, God, speak to somebody to give to me. That his faith life is a little foolish to the natural mind. When I understand that giving in the mind of God is inseparable from what I'm receiving and I have a need, I don't have enough in my own life. I am saying that when you get a revelation of this, when it becomes not just a sermon but a God word to you, 
when you have a need, your first thought, your first prayer won't be, God, send somebody to give to me. Your first thought, your first prayer, Holy Spirit, open up my eyes. Open up my eyes. Help me to see what you want me to sow. Open up my eyes. Help me to see where you want me to sow. God, open up my eyes. Yes, my kids need some more clothes. God, open up my eyes. Help me to see whose kids I can sow into. Because I understand that when I sow into your kids, in the mind of God, God doesn't separate my seed from receiving. God says when you sow it, it's going to come back to you, but it's not going to come back the same way that you went out. You're going to sow it at this level. When I send it back, it's going to be at this level. God, open up my eyes. Now, once I've sown the seed, I stand in faith. God, you said, I didn't say it, God, you said, give, and men would give to me. God, I thank you men are giving to me. I thank you that men are giving to my family. I thank you that men are giving to my kids. I position myself to receive because I didn't separate the receiving from the giving. God is committed to ensuring that you live a life where you lack nothing. That is His will. That is His will. And to walk in His will, we have to lean into His wisdom. He says, my thoughts, they're not your thoughts. My ways of doing things are not your ways. But if you'll lean into what I said, if you'll mix faith with what I said, you may look foolish now. You may have some questions now. Don't put your mouth on it. Don't talk what you can't give. Don't talk what you don't have. Agree with me. And there's power in my word and power in your seed to turn around that need. Any receivers in the house? Any generous people in the house? We refuse to put limits on God. We refuse to put limits on what we receive. God, I'm open. I'm not going to settle. I'm not going to settle for yesterday's blessing. You blessed me yesterday, and I'm grateful for it. God, you can keep blessing me. I'm going to keep giving. You keep on blessing. And I'm going to receive everything that you have for me. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.